Hey everyone, today I'm finally getting to this opinion piece from the New York Times that was published on Christmas Day called How Can I Possibly Believe That Faith Is Better Than Doubt? Now that is one juicy question, let's find out the answer. Why is it that according to Jesus, faith is better than proof? Well, I have a few obvious suggestions that you probably apply in every other area of life where someone asks you to believe them without evidence, but I'm not going to go there already when you've only just started. That's a question I've struggled to answer ever since I began my pilgrimage of faith as a young man. Sometimes it seemed more pressing, other times less so. It can intensify during periods of grief and pain when faith may not offer much consolation or even make much sense in a world that seems random and cruel. You know, I find this mindset really interesting and also kind of incomprehensible. To me, the demand for proof is just the regular day-to-day -day requirement to get through life. If someone tells you they have a bridge to sell you, you demand proof that they actually have it. This isn't an emotional response, it's exactly the opposite. It's something you do when you're cool-headed and emotionally detached enough to remember to do it. And I think this is why when you see people starting to get way too emotionally invested in things like politics or religion, they start to believe more falsehoods that appear to confirm their ideas. They don't look into things so deeply anymore, they just look for anything that makes them feel right. It feels good emotionally to be right about the thing that you care about. But here we have a Christian echoing something that I hear a lot from the religious, that doubt and the requirement for evidence only comes into the picture when tragedy strikes and they feel emotionally vulnerable, while at other times when they're in a more neutral mood, faith is more than enough. And I don't exactly bring this up as a religious versus non-religious distinction because there are also a lot of Christians who insist that they only began to turn to faith when tragedy struck, whereas before that they were skeptical. So it goes both ways. So I'm not really bringing it up as a criticism of religious thought, it's more just that I find it interesting how people from all walks of life can instinctively react to the same stimuli in completely opposite ways like this. This question is compounded during periods like this one, when faith seems to distort reality rather than clarify it, when it's easily manipulated for low rather than high purpose, and when some of those who claim to be people of faith act in ways that bring dishonor to it and themselves. Yeah, periods like this one, I honestly have no idea what that refers to. Was there something in the news in December that I'm unaware of? I mean, I don't know of any very recent and prominent cases of Christian terrorism or anything, but I've also been pretty unplugged lately, so it's very possible that something passed me by. I don't know, whatever. So even though I'm not sure why this period is being singled out, I can definitely agree that at all times there are certainly a lot of nasty people out there using faith to manipulate people and distort reality. That's always been true. Whether you think faith is a good way to find the truth or not, I think that's just an undeniable fact. Why take a leap of faith given all that? Insisting on a little more empirical evidence before you make the leap seems pretty reasonable. Um, yep. If you want to keep from being manipulated by people, that's what you're going to have to do, yeah. And by the way, I've read the rest of this article, and you don't actually offer any kind of solution to this. You just extol the virtues of faith without offering any actual solutions to the very real and incredibly significant problems that you yourself brought up in the introduction to the article. I would be very curious how you think people can solve those problems and make sure that they're not being manipulated and used, because that's incredibly important, but this isn't touched on again, so forget it, I guess. The Apostle Thomas clearly thought so. According to the Gospel of John, the other disciples told Thomas that they had seen the risen Lord, to which Thomas replied he wouldn't believe until he put his fingers in the nail marks in Jesus' hands and put his hand into Jesus' side. Yeah, isn't that story nasty? I mean, I get wanting to see the wounds, but that's some next level shit. Maybe they looked really fake, like Halloween zombie makeup, and he wanted to make sure it actually broke the skin? I don't know. Either way, all I can say is I hope they both washed up real good both before and after the fisting session. You wouldn't want God to go through all that trouble of being dramatically killed and resurrected only to die of infection and have to go through the whole business again. And altars just wouldn't have the same flair if instead of having a big cross above them, they had a big wooden bacterium instead. Fast forward a week when Thomas encounters Jesus, who tells him, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas does, to which Jesus replies, Because you have seen me, you have believed. No, more like because you've penetrated me, you've believed. And speaking of which, if nobody's turned the story of Thomas shoving his appendage into Jesus' gaping wet hole into a porno, get on that. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Not seeing and still believing is held up by Jesus as a greater thing than seeing and believing. But I'm not sure I have ever fully grasped what it is about faith that makes it precious in the eyes of God. Hey, look, Thomas was a clean guy, Jesus knew him, so he let it slide that time, but that doesn't mean he's gonna set up in the mall for all the kids to wriggle their snotty little fingers around in his gash while they ask him for presents for his birthday. Alright, let's not be unreasonable here. I'm all for evidence, Pete, but the guy's gotta draw a line somewhere.
Recently, with the help of friends, pastors, theologians, authors, fellow believers, I've tried to deepen my understanding on that subject. To start out, it's worth noting that treating Christian faith as different from proof doesn't mean it's antithetical to evidence and reason. Christianity is a faith that claims to be rooted in history, not abstract philosophy. St. Paul wrote that if Jesus was not resurrected from the dead, the Christian faith is futile, and followers of Jesus are of all people most to be pitied. Sure, but it also demands that you accept the historicity of said resurrection on faith. It's not asking you to pour over historical documents and scientific evidence to reach an entirely neutral, unbiased conclusion on whether it actually happened or not. It starts with the demand that you accept the truth of it and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior or wind up in hell for your doubt. Yes, the Bible, like most religious texts, says things happened in the past, and it's important to the story. It's also important to Islam that Muhammad talked to Gabriel. If that didn't happen, Islam isn't true. Just like if the resurrection didn't happen, Christianity isn't true. You know, the Bible also has the creation of the universe and all life on earth in six days, and the story of Noah's flood as historical claims, but just because something is presented as a historical claim does not make belief in it inherently reasonable or evidence-based, and uncritical faith-based belief any less stupid. Obviously, Christians understand that it would be an incredibly serious problem for the religion if the resurrection never occurred in real, actual history. But that claim alone does not justify your claim that faith is not antithetical to evidence and reason. Even if it's not antithetical to evidence and reason, your argument doesn't show that it's not. That's the point. I mean, I'm just saying your argument's not going to get you where you think it's going to get you. Christians would say, in fact, that reason is affirmed in scripture. Come now and let us reason together, is how the prophet Isaiah puts it. Uh-huh, so you mean Isaiah 1, where God lays out how horrible the people are who he's talking to, and then basically says, look guys, listen to reason here. If you keep up like this, you're going to be eaten by the sword, so smarten the fuck up and obey me if you want a nice life. Or in other words, when you actually read that verse in context, instead of misappropriating it as a soundbite to try to make a point about how intelligent Christianity is, it's not extolling the wondrousness of reasoning. Now, even by the most charitable interpretation, it's just a bit of tough love. This has nothing whatsoever to do with instructing believers in how they should be determining the truth of history or how they should be thinking about problems. It has no bearing at all on whether God or your religion promotes believing whatever the most rigorous analysis of the arguments and evidence may lead you to. No, it's just one more demand for obedience in a book that's all about demands for obedience. But wow, this is already starting to get a little bit long for where I'm actually at in the article, and there's no way I'm going to do a two-part on this, so I'd better start picking my battles here. Reason purifies faith, George Weigel, my colleague at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, told me. Faith without reason risks descending into superstition. Reason without faith builds a world without windows, doors, or skylights. But faith itself, while not the converse of reason, is still distinct from it. Wait, that's the entire argument for why faith doesn't conflict with evidence and reason? Okay, point one, Paul thought it would suck if the resurrection was fake. Point two, out of context Old Testament verse. Point three, a quote from your colleague where he just asserts your conclusion with no reasons given. Okay, uh, I can't say I find that very convincing. Sorry. But you know, you have an out. I mean, your buddy said reason without faith builds a world without windows, doors, or skylights, so you can really just write me off as closed-minded and pretend your argument doesn't suck ass. I mean, if you want to. If it seems like that's asking too much, if you think leaps of faith are for children rather than adults, yeah, kinda. Consider this. Materialists, rationalists, and atheists ultimately place their trust in certain propositions that require faith. Oh, well, never mind then. I guess that excuse to write me off won't work. Because I have faith, which means I have all the windows, doors, and skylights that you do. And yet that brilliant sunlight of your wonderful argument still fails to illuminate my room. So I'm a little bit confused here, though, because if materialists, rationalists, and atheists all have faith, then who exactly is left to populate this windowless, doorless, skylightless box? People in comas? To say that truth is only intelligible through reason is itself a statement of faith. Hmm, well there are a lot of materialists and atheists, maybe not so much rationalists, who don't believe that. Personally, I'm not sure I would actually say that. It depends how exactly you're thinking about it, but I think there are plenty of truths that can be reached purely on dumb lizard brain instinct that you can even experience in your sleep. You know, for example, I am currently experiencing the sensation of hunger. You don't actually have to rationally consider that. Your brain just goes, hungry, 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 hungry. 
But look, Pete, here's the thing about this, right? Like, I can know that I'm hungry. I don't need any logical thought to figure that out. I don't even need to be conscious. But what we're talking about specifically is people trying to convince other people that things are true, or when they're trying to figure things out about external reality. And in those cases, I'm not aware of any time that I've ever heard anyone try to demonstrate a claim without appealing to reason. And yes, I include faith-based claims in that too. You can take the resurrection as a pretty good example. You're not just saying here, I believe it's true, period, end of story. You're saying, I believe it's true because, followed by some nonsensical attempt at reasoning. The word because is key. That word alone puts it in the realm of reasoning because it implies X therefore Y, some kind of train of thought. Let's go a bit broader, another example, belief in God. Someone might try to justify to themselves why they believe in God. They might say, my belief in God is justified by faith. And you might say, well, they're not using reason to try to reach the truth, they're using faith. Well, no. Premise one, faith is sufficient justification for belief. Premise two, I have faith, therefore I have sufficient justification for belief in God. That's reason. I mean, sure, it's not great reasoning, but it's still an appeal to reason to try to support a claim. And I'm not even sure what else you could do. Even if they're just like, God is real because I feel like he is, well, there's your because again, that's reasoning. I mean, it's fallacious reasoning, it's dumb, but it's still reasoning. So if someone's going to convince me there's some better way to consider what may or may not be true about reality than reason, they're going to have to suggest to me what other way might even exist first, because I honestly can't think of one. Maybe I'm just being stupid right now, but I can't think of an example. Denying the existence of God is as much a leap of faith as asserting it. How do you figure? I mean, let's step back for a second. You can assert the existence of God with no leaps of faith at all. Sure, in my opinion, it takes some shoddy reasoning, but that doesn't mean everybody realizes or agrees that it's shoddy reasoning. Some people, when they start believing in God, don't just suddenly develop faith. They are convinced by the arguments. And much the same way, there are arguments against the existence of God, for the non-existence of God, I should say. And you can be convinced by those too. Neither of these things requires faith. You can say the arguments aren't good, but that doesn't mean it's an expression of faith. Like, what the hell are you talking about? As the pastor Tim Keller told me, most of the things we most deeply believe in, for example, human rights and human equality, are not empirically provable. How does he know? Has he tried? Maybe someday we'll finally crack the code of the fabric of reality and find the human rights woven in. <laughs> okay. But, okay, so faith just means not empirically provable to you then? But then the historicity of the resurrection, which most likely is also not empirically provable as true or false, would be purely a question of faith. Which means that your use of it as an example of why faith is not antithetical to evidence and reason fails utterly. Which leads me to question once again why you even brought it up. Now, I don't really need to address the human rights and equality thing. That's sort of a side issue, but I still will. Yes, in fact, I think human equality is empirically provable as long as you pick a metric by which humans are in fact equal. For example, we are all equally of the same species. We have all been born after an equal amount of evolutionary history, or at least a negligibly different amount depending on our ages. We all have an exactly equal amount of inherent value as opposed to the value that's put on us by others and ourselves, because value is a thing that's put on us by others and ourselves and therefore we have no inherent value. Inherent value is a nonsensical concept, it's an oxymoron, because value comes from how much someone values something. It's something placed onto something something by someone. That makes it entirely subjective and variable based on the opinions of different people, regardless of whether the person doing the valuation is a god or a human or whatever. And on other grounds, it's empirically provable that we're not equal. Our intelligence, our strength, our speed, our creativity, take your pick. That's the easy one. Now, as for human rights, the provability of them depends entirely on what you think human rights actually are. If you think they're what they are, which is such and such a person will be really upset if you don't recognize the rights of other people, such and such a person being one or more human beings who want to live in a society where we grant rights to each other and ourselves and hate to see them taken away, or God, or whoever you want to name, then yeah, that should in fact be provable if it's to mean anything at all, because you should be able to prove that there's someone there to get upset. And if it's not, I'm not sure why you're so worried about this such and such a person's opinion, because it appears they have no impact at all on anything actually real. And if you think human rights are not that, if you think there's something inherent to the nature of reality itself, well, you're gonna need to explain to me exactly what you think they are, because I don't see how the hell that would work. I don't know, religious people always seem to have a very strange idea of what the hell rights are, as if they're not just like the basic social contract thing that we need to get along with each other, that they are, which is why we like them so much. And they never really seem to explain what exactly they mean, it's always this vague, hand-wavy bullshit, so forget it. I I'm really sorry though, I meant to move this along a little bit faster, but I can't help rambling about every line in the article, so I'm gonna try real hard now to just stick to the best bits from now on, okay?
Perhaps the key to understanding why faith is prized within the Christian tradition is that it involves trust that would not be needed if the existence of God were subject to a mathematical proof. What God is seeking is not our intellectual assent so much as a relationship with us. Okay, let me get this straight. A guy wants a relationship with you, and his step one is to utterly refuse to prove to you that he even exists. He passes a note that says, I heart you to a friend of 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 yours, and asks them to pass it on down the line of friends all the way to you without ever showing his face to you. Okay, one, creepy. Two, is this guy a total idiot? Every meaningful relationship, parent-child, spouse-to-spouse, friend-to-friend, involves some degree of trust. Yeah, and you know step one to trusting someone? is knowing they exist. That bit's kind of important. If someone wants me to trust them, they can start there. Hmm? Good. It is better and more vivifying to be the object of someone's trust rather than the last person standing after a series of logical deductions. Dude, you didn't start out with this being about trust. You explicitly stated this is about figuring out whether God exists at all. Forget whether you trust him. How about this? Hey God, show me you exist, and then we can have a good long heart to heart, get to know each other over a cup of coffee. You know, maybe we can go have a few guys nights out, right? And then over time, as I learn more about your personality, I'll decide if I find you trustworthy, okay? These things don't just happen, my dude. First things first, let's take it slow. Let it happen naturally, man. Craig Barnes, the president of Princeton Theological Seminary, told me, Faith is a greater blessing than proof because it gives us a relationship with Jesus. All good relationships are bound together by love, and love is always an expression of faith. No, it's an expression of feelings. It doesn't require faith or any other basis for belief. There's no belief of any kind required. Except, obviously, that the person exists. Except when it comes to anime waifus. Trust, though, is a bit of a different thing. See, unless you're a complete fool who's gonna be doomed to getting fucked around by malicious abusers for your entire life, you're gonna have to learn early on to trust people based on your history with them, how they've behaved in the past. And your belief or disbelief in whether or not they love you is gonna be based on something similar. But the one thing you're not terribly likely to have, and you most definitely should not be expected to have, is trust or love for someone who your friend told you that their friend told them that their cousin told them exists, and lives on top of Mount Everest casting badass lightning spells and conjuring a large-breasted liger women in bikinis. Save that trust and love for once you climb the mountain and find out that guy actually exists. Or for the liger women. He also pointed out that proofs don't necessarily inspire belief. Toward the end of his gospel, Matthew mentions that some still doubted after they looked right at the risen Christ. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Okay, fine, yeah, proofs don't always inspire belief, sure. But, like, would it kill you to try? <laughs> I mean, when you want to be in a relationship with me, the minimum first step I expect is for you to clue me into the fact that you're there. You don't just hide in the bushes outside my house at night and peep in my windows. I mean, aside from the fact that if I find out you've been doing that, you're not exactly a person I'm going to want to grab a beer with, how the hell am I supposed to come up with the idea to even ask you if you want to grab a beer if you're actually out there? I don't know you're there. Some of those who witnessed the miracles of Jesus eventually sought to kill him, and Judas, one of Jesus' original disciples, betrayed him with a kiss. So sensory experience isn't enough to compel belief in allegiance. Sure, not everyone's impressed by magic tricks, and even among those who are, not everybody's gonna be your friend. You ever see the prestige? But dude, if you get so pissy about one guy who doesn't believe you right away and another guy who betrays you, that your reaction is to completely retreat from the world and hide away in your windowless, doorless, sunlightless box, hoping that friends are gonna come to you, well, don't you find that to be a bit of a counterproductive overcompensation? Jesus Christ, deal with your trust issues. Our most important forms of knowledge rarely come from logic or proof, according to Sherry Harder, the president of the Trinity Forum. Citing the work of the theologian Leslie Newbegin, she says it comes through a more personal knowledge. For example, I know my wife loves me because I know her, I know her heart, I know her character, and because I trust her. And there's that because again. That means you've made your mind up based on some form of reasoning. In this case, because you have prolonged experience with your wife, she's behaved quite consistently in a manner that you associate with trustworthy worthiness and love, and therefore you hold the belief that she loves you and that she can be trusted. It's perfectly logical and there's no faith required, and indeed no faith even expressed in your statement. Over time you've gained confidence that your wife acts and feels certain ways because you've observed her behavior. That's the evidence part, which you term proof. 
And you used your recollection of those experiences as the premises for a little bit of logical thought that led you to a conclusion, which is that she's trustworthy and she loves you. That's not a belief based on faith. That's a belief based on interpretation of evidence, dude. If your wife suddenly started cheating on you, stealing from you all the time, I don't know, beat your dog to death, and started chasing you around the house with a hammer, you would probably change your mind because the evidence changed. Where is your confusion here? Faith, Ms. Harder added, is tied to love in a way that logical deduction and reason are not. We are changed by what we love more than what we think. Dude, love's not faith-based, because faith is something you base beliefs on. Love is not a belief. Yeah, believing someone else loves you is a belief, but your love for other people is a feeling. An emotion. It doesn't take logic or reason or faith or any other means of forming beliefs to feel emotions because emotions are not beliefs. Man, I really wish people would just figure out how to make clear distinctions between concepts already. I mean, of all the things that frustrate me on a daily basis in this job, that's gotta be my biggest pet peeve. There's one other difference between faith and reason. The latter can analyze things like quantum physics and modern cosmology, but what faith can do is put our lives in an unfolding narrative in ways reason cannot. It gives us a role in a gripping drama of which the Christmas story is one defining scene. It's a drama that includes sin and betrayal, redemption and grace, and ultimately it gives purpose to our lives despite the brokenness and pain we experience. This may mean nothing to you, but to people of faith it can mean everything. If God is real, perhaps it should. Uh, Pete? You know, it's nice and all that you feel like you're part of a big grand story or whatever. I'm sure you find it real exciting and impressive and all that, but the truth is not bound to how gripping you find the drama to be or how much you dig on Christmas. Lots of people believe all kinds of gripping dramas. That doesn't mean they're all right. And in that vein, I have a suggestion for you. If you really want to base your deepest beliefs about the nature of reality on how badass a story it makes in your head, well, look at the previous paragraph. You mentioned Tolkien there and pagan myths, and I know for a fact that there are way more epic and gripping dramas to be found in both of those sources than any of the literary sedatives you can pick out of the Bible. It's notable that when Thomas makes his request to Jesus, he's not condemned. Rather, Jesus gives Thomas what he needed, in his gaze proof, and in doing so makes it clear that Jesus is willing to meet us where we are. Yeah, he'll meet you where you are, and then he'll imply that you're a piece of shit for being there as he blesses other people for not being there. All right, well, that was fine, I guess, but this is getting a little bit old already, and I'm going to call it a day here. So if you like my channel, subscribe and like the video, and if you really like my channel, consider supporting me on Patreon, like all these $5 and up champions on the screen right here, and all the other people who support me through Patreon and PayPal. All of you are my favorite people in the world. You're what keeps the engine running here, and it's much appreciated, seriously. See you all soon.